I'm very happy to be part of these celebrations. Uh, but also, um, when I got this email, and in that somewhere it said that you know, there will be a time capsule, and that kind of freaked me out. 100 years down the line, somebody, I don't know who that unlucky soul would be, they will open up that capsule and who knows, maybe they will listen to this talk. So I was kind of feeling under pressure that I should say something meaningful, but it's very difficult to predict what might happen in the next 100 years. So I thought a topic which, uh, of course, is close to my research, but also like at the core of our current understanding of the brain, and that is the idea of excitation and inhibition and the balance of the two. So the core idea right now is that uh, uh, if you know what excitation is, of course you do, inhibition you do. If you can balance them, you have the basic raw material to make a brain, a functioning brain. Of course, after that, rest is detail. So that's what I'll try to show you something about. Okay. Um, before I do that, uh, I have to thank a lot of people. I'm part of a very active network of excellent scientists uh, spread all over the world. Uh, largely in Freiburg, but uh, elsewhere and now in KDH also, and my collaborators and, of course, funders. It shows you that what it takes to do neuroscience, uh, um, it's a very complicated topic, and you have to be part of an excellent network to be able to ask and answer questions. So just as I was uh, entering this, somebody asked me, what are you going to talk about? I said, about the brain. And the immediate reaction was, so uh, are you a medical person? I said, no. I said, I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer. So there, the, the question was, oh, so are you a biochemical engineer or something like that? I'm none of those. I'm a, trained as an electrical engineer. And uh, during somewhere in my master's studies, I stumbled upon this little diagram. This is an electrical equivalent of a neuron. Neuron, of course, we know from high school drawings and so on. But this is an electrical equivalent of a neuron. And I said, OK, I'm an engineer. I know how to deal with these circuits. Brain is just a few billion of these. So this was the novice talking in me. I also by chance stumbled upon that book, From Neuron to Brain, an excellent book. And that introduced uh, uh, me to the complexity and beauty of the brain. And since then, that's what I've been doing. When we think of the brain, and you start to, to search for, you get like some information which is quite fascinating to know that this is about 2% of your body weight. It consumes about 20% of the energy that whole body consumes. Uh, uh, there's a lot of blood vessels going through it, but uh, almost 60% of it is just fat. And there are loads of neurons. And there are also myths going around that you use about 10% of your brain. So this is absolutely nonsense. You use all the brain all the time. But these things, however fascinating they are, they are actually useless if you want to understand how brain functions. To understand a system, how it works, and if you don't know anything about it, you first need to do is to see it in action. And the very first thing that uh, people started uh, was, I think, started with uh, uh, Richard Caton, but Hans Berger was the one who formalized it. Uh, he showed us that uh, brain generates electrical activity, and you can record it from the scalp, just putting electrodes on the surface of the brain, and he found out that the nature of this activity changes in relation to the behavior. So this becomes a fundamental question in neuroscience, that uh, how does our behavior reflect in electrical activity patterns? And this is what we are looking in then. But if you want to understand how this electricity comes about, you have to dig a bit deep in the brain. Obviously, we can't work with human brains, so we need to create animal models of this. For instance, we use mouse brain a lot. And you take a little piece of uh, this uh, uh, brain and make a slice, look it under the microscope, and you find such beautiful drawings. This drawing was created by Ramoni Kahal almost uh, more than 100 years ago. He came to Stockholm to pick a prize for drawing this. Uh, now we are still doing the same thing, just a bit in more detail, more colorful. But I think from Kahal's days to today, what we have uh, uh, found out is that Neurons, they come in a variety of types. They are beautiful structures. Uh, uh, some look like trees, some look like chandeliers, and accordingly, they are not named like that. And, of course, there are loads of brains, and uh, uh, they have a different uh, number of neurons in them. Number of neurons in the brain is not a predictor of the brain activity or its ability to function, but still, it's an interesting number to, to talk about. So the question that Berger initially initiated now transforms, and it becomes a question that how does the neural activity relate to the behavior? And not just the activity of individual neurons. Here I'm showing you activity of individual neurons in a mouse brain when they are whisking. 
So this neuron is active and as soon as it's whisked, this activity goes down and so on. But not just individual neurons. We are interested in activity of groups of neurons, how they behave together. So this is the, the core of the question then, that how does neural activity change in relation to brain function and brain dysfunction and how can we restore it, how we control it, how do we generate it. So when you want to ask a question about uh, neural activity, how it comes about, you need to go further uh, one level below it and try to find out how are these neurons arranged. They are not individual neurons, they are connected to each other. They are connected via something we call as synapses. And this is not a physical contact, there is a little gap and some chemical comes from the presynaptic side to the postsynaptic side and that makes it all work. There are two types of connections, one are excitatory and hence the name or, or the term in my title excitation and inhibitory and the inhibition in my title. So there are only two types of connections in the brain, positive and negative if you wish, excitatory and inhibitory. So the whole magic is about connecting these together. Uh, if you go further and try to look at the organization of these networks, then you will find out that in different brain regions there are different kind of uh, networks and there are three prominent types. One type, this is a type of network that is found in very old regions of the brain that we share with the uh, fish and so on. They are mainly made up of inhibitory neurons, meaning all the connections are just negative polarity. There are other types of connections, uh, networks, where you have both positive and negative, meaning excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But excitatory neurons do not talk to each other directly. And then we have the complete uh, network where there are both types of neurons and they talk to each other directly. Now, this is very nice. You can create these motifs. But what is so interesting about this? Interesting fact about this is that first, it's a very dense network. So about 100,000 neurons in one millimeter cube of it. This is these days not so fascinating because our electronics has improved and we can compress even more devices in one millimeter cube. But what we have not been able to achieve in our uh, electronic devices, and that's what makes uh, the brain unique, is number of connections per neuron. So we don't know any single device that is connected to 10,000 of uh, other devices. And look at the number of connections in per millimeter cube. And this is something that is very peculiar to the brain and that renders it uh, its function. Obviously, these connections, they are of both types, positive and negative, and they have to be balanced. So this is what we are interested in, how this balance arrives, what are the consequences of the balance of excitation and inhibition, and if this gets mismatched, what happens? So this is a theorist's brain. I mean, not the actual brain of a theorist, but uh, the, the, the thing that theorists call a brain. So we forget about this thing now. We think of brain as made up of different networks of such uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurons which are talking to each other and creating kind of a network of networks which receives external input, they talk to each other and we are interested in the dynamical activity of this network. We use uh, mathematical analysis for it, meaning you can describe all this in form of equations and solve them in some cases. Also, you put them in a computer and you run a computer model, you create a simulation of this and you get to see what these neurons are doing. This is an example. And I'm just picking up examples which are related to this balance of excitation and inhibition. So if the two things are completely balanced, excitation and inhibition, they come together, they are equal in amplitude, you get such activity, very low firing rate. So each row is a neuron, each dot is a time when a neuron becomes active and talks to others very low activity, more or less unstructured. If excitation and inhibition, they are matched in their amplitude, meaning their strength is same, but one comes slightly before the other one, then you start to see these kind of synchronous events, as we call them, these ones, and they are relevant for behavior. You go from here to here. When you do something meaningful, for instance, these correlations, as we call them, they get increased or decreased. And if you mismatch both excitation and inhibition, if they are not in the balance, then you get some kind of oscillatory activity, so-called rhythms of the brain, something that you will encounter when you doze off now by listening to me. So it's all the, the magic of this balancing of excitation and inhibition that you go from this activity to this activity to this activity. And if I now put it in this uh, framework that, let's say, on x-axis I put 
the balancing of this, the equal weight, or sorry, the weight of excitation and inhibition. And on y-axis, I put the relative timing that excitation comes before or after. Turns out, when excitation is exceeding, meaning you are in an excitation-dominated regime, brain activity is always going to be very, very synchronous, very high firing rate, and nothing much is happening, even if you adjust the timing of it. On the other hand, if you are working in an inhibition-dominated regime, then you get different kind of activity depending on whether you increase the inhibition or decrease it, or you adjust the timing of it. Meaning you can go from different states by adjusting these, uh, uh, the balance of excitation and inhibition. Why is this important? So it turns out when we match our models with actual data that comes out of animal experiments and sometimes from human experiments, these kind of activity states is what we see in the brain whether you are active, working something, you are listening to a boring talk like now, or you are sleeping, and anything like that. So this is the good stage to be in. So your brain is always in so-called inhibition-dominated regime. And this activity gives you many different functionality. You have different states, you can switch between them, your networks are much faster than the neurons, so your neurons individually can be very, very slow, but your brain will be very fast. You can amplify fluctuations, change gain, and so on. These are a long list of uh, uh, features that you get in inhibition-dominated regime alone. Of course, these are very abstract. I don't expect you to know all this because you maybe are not from uh, neuroscience. But these properties that we abstractly describe, they directly relate to the behavior. If you mismatch your excitation and inhibition, severe problems may appear, for instance, brain diseases. To give you an example, remember this now? this kind of rhythmic activity, and if I try to count what kind of frequencies are there in this, I can create such plots where on x-axis I put frequency, on y-axis I put how strong that frequency is. And this is data coming from uh, uh, animal model of Parkinson's disease, a disease in which people have severe difficulties in moving, making decisions, controlling their body postures. They are basically locked. In those humans and also animals, what you get is this 20 hertz rhythm, which is very, very prominent. And if you compare it to a, a normal, healthy rat or a healthy human, you don't have that. So this is a disease in that sense where you have changed your excitation and inhibitions in such a way that you end up in an increased rhythmic state. If you look at absence epilepsy, which is very, very different from Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, largely you get cognitive and movement-related disorders. Absence epilepsy is that you somehow blank out you hear nothing for a few seconds. If you look at those brains, they're also, as soon as this absence episode starts, you start to see some rhythmic activity, which you can see in this color map as power around 10 hertz. If you somehow stimulate this brain now with, in this case, uh, lasers, this activity disappears and the person or the animal comes out of the absence episode. So this is also basically the same thing that you have increased rhythms in the brain. If you look at schizophrenia, this is controls, meaning healthy humans, and these are patients with schizophrenia diagnosis. There, if you look at the, the synchronization of oscillations now, healthy humans are able to synchronize their oscillations in this frequency band as opposed to schizophrenia patients. They cannot do it. So this is a disease which is actually a disease of decrease of synchrony in the oscillations. This is what a doctor will tell you if you go there. If you come to a theorist, they will tell you, well, sorry, you have a disease of oscillations. It's not schizophrenia, it's not Parkinson's disease, it's not absence. When you come with these symptoms, I know that something has changed between excitation and inhibition, that inhibition is stronger. By the way, same thing in absence and Parkinson's disease, identical, just that they happen to be in different parts of the brain. And here, you would diagnose that uh, uh, the inhibitory and excitatory interactions, they have weakened, both of them simultaneously. Now, this is a very, very different take on brain diseases. Our current approach to brain diseases, the traditional way of thinking about it is that I compare your behavior to a population behavior, and I declare you whether you are healthy or sick. Similarly, you come to a doctor comparing your behavior with your previous behavior, thinking that something has changed in you. So this is the way we diagnose brain diseases, based on just behavioral readout. 
you see these kind of drawings. This is how a pa Parkinsonian patient would look like. If you get a stroke, they will ask you to draw something and see which part of the brain may be damaged and so on and so forth. So you start with this, and then what you try is that from disease symptoms, you jump and assume that there must be some mutations in the genes, some chemicals must be gone, some brain part must be damaged. But what we are doing here is that we are jumping from about a scale of a meter, that's our size roughly, to molecules which are about Angstrom's time scales. We are jumping 12 orders of magnitude. And we are hoping that we'll find a direct correlate from this level to that level. And look how fairly we are dealing with this. Now we find hundreds of genes for schizophrenia, tens of genes for Parkinson's disease, and so on and so forth, meaning this one-on-one -on -one mapping that we were dreaming of just doesn't exist. And of course it cannot exist because you are jumping over 12 orders of magnitude, not just in space, but also in time. Molecular time scales are very different from behavioral time scales. So we think that uh, this is kind of a, a very unsatisfactory state, even though we are making a lot of effort in this. We need something else, and I suppose that this dynamical perspective that I was trying to give you, that is this idea of balance of excitation inhibition, could give a, a, a fresh perspective to this. So this is what we are now uh, dealing with. So a large part of theoretical neuroscience, computational neuroscience, is, is investigating this, that uh, uh, going instead of sim from symptoms to direct causes at the, at the circuit level, uh, sorry, at the genetic and, and chemical level, you in between come to the level of uh, a network of neurons. And this is the place you develop your theories. You try to understand that what are the neural correlates of these diseases and how these co uh, neural activity correlates, they relate to the genetics or the, the morphological changes. And this is where I hope that uh, in future what we will see a huge development in the form of theory and models, not just to understand the, the activity in diseases or in function, but also to control it. Because eventually the hypothesis would go to the extent saying that uh, if you can alter the brain activity, you can repair the brain. And this is what we do for Parkinson's disease patients. We give them deep brain stimulation, and that's what we try to do that. So hope that uh, 100 years down the line, when somebody will look at this, by that time it will look elementary, because this, I hope, would have developed, and they would uh, uh, yeah, judge us kindly and not laugh at us. But also, I mean, to, to do this, this can't be done in isolation. This has to be done in conjunction with experiments. So on one hand, we have theory. On the other hand, we have to perform all kinds of experiments, sometimes humans, but when not possible with animals, bring in the data, create appropriate models, and try to make this loop to get to this dream where we can try to understand brain uh, function and dysfunction in this dynamical sense in the form of properties of electrical activity. So, so to say not understand the brain at this level and not at this level. This is the job of psychologists. This is the job of neuroscientists to understand the brain in the form of network interactions. And at that level, excitation and inhibition is the most basic recipe that uh, we have to make this brain function. Thank you very much.